Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sean O'Hara. I lead business development and partnerships at Clarity. Um, I'll be our moderator today, um, which basically means I'm hoping to speak as little as possible. Um, so we just have a brief agenda. So again, thank you for joining the webinar. Um, this is really a roundtable discussion on grant funded community air quality monitoring work. Um, the idea of advancing from funding to impact in the area of community air monitoring, what these collaborations look like, et cetera. So just briefly, um, our agenda is kind of as follows. Wanted to briefly introduce some of the grant funding. There's a lot going on in the world right now. We've seen this evolving a lot over the last several years from state-based air monitoring funds into the huge influx of funding coming from our partners of the US EPA. Um, talking a little bit about community air monitoring. What have we seen working? What have we not seen working? The kinds of partnering models and different collaborative um, frameworks that have been coming together. And then the real exciting part to me um, is really going to be the panelists that we've assembled today from our various partners who we'll be introducing momentarily. And then finally, we really wanted to save some time to have a good, robust Q&A section, um, taking your questions and having our you know, fantastic panelists being able to respond to such, given their really uh, phenomenal experiences in this space. So with that, we'll jump to the next slide, please. So wanted to briefly introduce all of our amazing panelists. Um, so I'm joined with two of our collaborators from Brightline Defense, so Cecilia Mejia and Trinity Van, um, both of whom have been working with us in the San Francisco area. I have Adrian Rain with Valley Vision uh, in the Sacramento area, who's been working with us as well. Um, Cecilia, Trinity, and Adrian, all representing kind of the community-based uh, organization or CBO perspectives. Uh, joined here with Aubrey Burgess, um, one of my new colleagues who we um, adopted from the city and county of Denver most recently, where she was previously running the Love My Air project. So really unique experience in terms of now working with projects on their air monitoring networks from the Clarity side, having formerly been in the government seat. And then finally joined with our local collaborator, Michael Flagg, um, from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and Bay Air Center. Um, so we'll be hearing from all five of these amazing partners shortly, just after a few kind of prefacing slides a little bit. Um, so next slide, please. Thanks, Ryan. So why are we talking about this? What's the big deal with grants, community air monitoring? Everybody here is probably pretty familiar with this. Um, but just to put into context, really, you know, an explosion of effort around this space. Um, we recognize that there's fantastic regulatory monitoring in the country, but we also recognize that that has some limitations in terms of representation for communities. Um, so over the last several years, we've seen a number of different state and federal programs evolving out that have really been designed and leveraged um, to help us provide data more representative of communities often struggling with environmental justice or environmental equity solutions. So we've seen examples of this at state levels like the California Air Resources Board, um, working together also with Assembly Bill 617 or AB 617 as we call it more casually. And the idea is this is allocated tens if not over hundred million dollars between air monitoring and capacity building and frameworks, et cetera, within the states. And even now in 20, that's 2023 now, but over the last year, we've seen the US EPA's Enhanced Air Quality Monitoring Program for Communities, really dedicated to supplement regulatory monitoring with lower cost sensors or mid cost sensors or other kind of air quality tools. And the idea is that these can help supplement the traditional NACs or Clean Air Act type pollutant uh, monitoring that we're doing and providing really substantial amounts of funding to help build programs to really respond to community needs and gaps in the monitoring um, and address some of these inequities. Next slide, please. So a lot of funding on the street, as I think most everybody is aware of us here, um, courtesy of our Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so currently there is a whole bunch of solicitations out on the street, um, various different formats, very exciting for different kinds of uh, applications. A couple of these I just wanted to highlight that be aware of and maybe relevant to your interests or some of the stakeholders in your community. So we have the EJCPS, Collaborative Problem Solving, which is really about building capacity and CBOs, working with CBOs, um, so to speak, around specific environmental justice issues, environmental justice government to government grants, partnerships between state agencies, the prime applicants in this case, working together with community-based organizations. And I do want to emphasize that both of these are not focused explicitly on air quality and can support broader ranges of environmental justice topics, um, but are really exciting opportunities in many cases to build capacity or help structure foundational programs. 
um, you know, at half a million dollars or a million dollars respectively. Um, we have also just recently seen the EJTCGM grants announced, and this is not a direct application for most of the participants here, but these will be passed through funds to grant, uh, future granting agencies, um, likely to provide $50 million at a time in terms of water divisions or air quality um, sub awards, et cetera, out to different groups. So keeping an eye on that one will be really interesting for us. And then finally, the CPRG grant that was just released. Uh, this is still a kind of a developing proposal. Well, you know, lots of GHG taking uh, GHG and air pollutant ramifications. Um, but do want to highlight each of these if these fall into the areas of interest um, for your entities. A um, little bit of information just in terms of the amounts, the eligible entities. We're always happy to chat and point, um, make some introductions and suggestions around how to explore these. Um, and then I do note that I have some colleagues from the US EPA who might be able to also volunteer some resources and uh, places to participate in Q&A and some of the upcoming sessions around these grants and processes. Next slide, please, Ryan. So I think one of the things that brings us all here to this webinar, and I think one of the topics that we really like to discuss is this idea of what makes community air monitoring successful. Um, many of you have heard me say that we can't go around just slapping sensors up on a post and hoping it's gonna solve problems, um, which is kind of funny as again, an air monitoring company in some ways that air monitoring alone is not really enough to do this. Um, so as we think about building successful grant applications, next slide, please. One of the biggest things that Clarity focuses on and with our partners and example partners, like we've um, coordinated here today in terms of our panelists and various experiences is the importance of bringing together diverse stakeholders. Um, I really appreciate the EPA's approach and CARB that with these solicitations, there's an increased emphasis on bringing together community partners with government stakeholders, with analytical partners, and looking at these kind of uh, comprehensive partner coalitions really helps us ensure that we have all the elements necessary to build outcomes oriented and really like successful collaborations around air monitoring. Um, so as we look at this, this is what again, we kind of refer to as our clarity model, as we're looking We'll integrate air monitoring technology, but ensuring that we have the government collaborators that are necessary to engage with the reference networks, establish appropriate QA, QC, um, help us validate sensor and increase the capacity with, uh, with our community partners. We want to engage with the communities themselves. Nobody knows the communities better than the community members themselves, go figure. Um, so it's really exciting seeing over the last several years, much more alignment between government partners and communities and much more collaboration. Um, I think it's much more successful overall. There's challenges in terms of how we communicate, how we meet, how we work together. There's definitely best practices in that space and some of these experiences that we'll be talking about on the panelists hereafter, uh, but really, really exciting. And then finally, the analysis piece. And I think this is something that as we consider who these partners are for our grants, this is really key. Um, because of course we can generate lots of data, we can validate such, we can engage with the community, but who's working with that data to actually distill insights, to develop policy, et cetera. So next slide, please, Ryan. So we look at examples of how this kind of model has worked. We actually kind of originated this thesis off of our work in London. We're pulling together a very vast kind of collaboration of Greater London Authority who originally funded the project, working with DEFRA, the local regulatory authority and the LAQN regulatory networks, working with Imperial College London and now other stakeholders, potentially like Vital Strategies, other public health groups to help analyze the data, um, engaging community at a broad kind of stroke, not just through maybe one CBO, but how do we be as scalable and inclusive as possible in these kinds of initiatives, working through boroughs, hospitals, school systems, um, borough specific community groups, for instance and then ensuring that we have appropriate combinations of air quality technology. Uh, there's no single solution for air quality, including clarity. How do we layer air toxics with clarity air monitoring networks, with our regulatory networks, with satellite data? Um, how do we bring all these things together in a way that makes a breathable difference for communities at the end of the day? Uh, always like to emphasize that at the end of the day, again, air monitoring, not enough without these partner collaborations. Uh, so without any further ado, can you jump to the next slide, please? I would love to turn it over to the team at Brightline Defense. Um, I'm actually really excited also that Eddie Ahn has uh, made a cameo appearance who can introduce his colleagues as well. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Eddie, um, to introduce your colleagues and then we'll take it from there. Thank you.
Thanks, Sean, and Eddie on, uh, Executive Director of Brightline. And for those of you that are being introduced to Brightline for the first time, we're an environmental justice nonprofit, and we essentially do two things at our nonprofit. One is direct services to frontline communities. So this takes the form of things like air quality monitoring, uh, delivering air filtration units. Uh, and also the second major thing that we do is really around policy. So we are in spaces such as building decarbonization, and meaning energy efficiency, for instance, and of course, IRA monies that are flowing toward this space. Uh, offshore wind is another big policy piece that we're in. More generally, we try to do everything in collaboration with a much broader ecosystem, meaning other service providers, particularly nonprofits in the space. Of course, government agencies like the California Air Resources Board and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, who you'll also hear from today. And uh, finally, and not least, uh, our technical partner, Clarity, who has been really tremendous to work with. But all this would not be possible without the hard work of Cecilia Mejia, our program manager, and Trinity Vang as well, our air quality organizer. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you, Eddie. Um, next slide, please, Ryan. Um, and then next slide, please. So uh, yes, you've heard a little bit about Brightline. Um, we're an environmental justice nonprofit, and we are a recipient of two air quality monitoring programs, essentially. Um, and we have a community air grant through the California Air Resources Board, um, as well as a James Carey Smith grant from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Um, and uh, essentially, we have shaped both a technical and a community outreach um, engagement uh, program through both of these uh, grants. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit about our timeline and kind of how we got started. So um, we kicked off the uh, community air grants with the AB 617 process back in January, 2020. Um, and we definitely didn't see the pandemic coming, but essentially we were uh, able to deploy um, throughout that year um, and really pick up wildfire smoke that was happening uh, in the fall uh, back in August, 2020. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with San Francisco, um, that was uh, in September, we had pretty bad uh, wildfires where we could actually step outside and see that the sky was orange and the sun looked red and it looked like the end of the world. Um, but that's kind of uh, our first baseline of wildfires uh, through this network. Um, and we kind of use that to incentivize um, our community um, surveying um, in the next uh, report, right? So we released a little room to breathe report, um, which was consisted of um, almost 300 um, SRO resident surveys um, and interviews talking about how air quality impacts them and their health impacts as well. Um, not only did we stop there, but we actually convened uh, state leaders. So uh, leaders from BACMED and CARB uh, to meet community leaders, community members, um, as well as tour um, a Chinatown um, SRO. And I'll be speaking a little bit about the community members um, that we work with, but um, there's a photo of the Chinese language media that we got for that tour. Um, and then we also partnered with a um, study with the Air District. So not only did we have our sensors pick up particulate matter 2.5, but it also picks up um, NO2 uh, because of this month long study and partnership with the Air District. Um, and then lastly, uh, right now we're in the process of partnering and expanding with UC Berkeley. So expanding our network, uh, almost double the size of our network uh, with AV uh, CDs, which are aerosolized black carbon devices. Next slide, please, Brian. So here are our partnerships, and I'll tell you a little bit more about um, the two community partnerships, but we partner with Central City SRO Collaborative, as well as Community Youth Center to really engage um, tenant leaders and residents of San Francisco and their youth. Um, and we have two technical partnerships within these programs as well. So um, obviously Clarity, um, and then also UC Berkeley, as I said. Next slide, please. So, um, how did we get started? How did we choose where to put um, and deploy the sensors? So we uh, looked at the California um, 
uh, Air, Re Air Resources Board Priority Populations Map. Um, and this is a public map that anybody can access. Um, and essentially we outlined two of the communities that we really wanted to work with. So SB 535 uh, Disadvantaged Community that's outlined um, in purple and an AV 1550 Low Income Community, which is outlined in blue. If the community is both low income and disadvantaged, um, it is highlighted in yellow. And uh, next slide, please, Ryan. And you can see that we modeled our network uh, to follow these community guidelines. So really serving the communities that are both disadvantaged um, communities as well as low income um, as defined legally by the California Air Resources Board. Next slide, please. So again, we partnered pretty heavily with the Air District um, to do sensor siting um, as well as deployment. Um, so we have some photos of Trinity and myself doing some maintenance, um, some deployments. Um, and then those of you who don't live in San Francisco, that's Eddie um, back in August of 2020. And you can kind of see that the guy looks like it has a filter on it, but it's actually not a filter. Um, and then uh, we have uh, the, SV, the SVS uh, system from the Air District. Next slide, please. Um, and then again, we partnered with UC Berkeley to do the Air Slides Black Carbon devices. And here you have a photo in the middle of the uh, researcher talking to SRO tenant leaders about this device. Next slide, please. Um, and then you can also see uh, how we kind of work towards our network to uh, monitor uh, priority populations. And you can see this screenshot shows really well kind of the distribution of air pollution um, throughout San Francisco um, on a particularly bad day. So this was uh, during um, a slight wildfire uh, back in January of last year. Next slide, please. Um, so why do we partner with Central City SR Collaborative? So um, essentially we want to reach priority populations and empower community members directly. So we work with um, residents who live in single room occupancy buildings in San Francisco um, to talk about air quality and engage them uh, on this topic as well. Next slide, please. Um, as well as talking to youth members. So um, a lot of the youth leaders that we work with, um, they uh, speak uh, two languages. So they're able to reach monolingual communities in Chinatown um, and uh, throughout San Francisco. Next slide, please. And then again, this is us convening uh, the California Air Resources Board as well as the Air District um, uh, to really talk about uh, some of the challenges that face Chinatown and some of the challenges that single room occupancy building tenant leaders have. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, lastly, we want to engage community members through uh, access to historical data. So there's a lot of um, programs out there that focus on uh, localized data, but um, most of the time don't have access to historical data. So this actually, this link is available for anybody who wants to look at the data in San Francisco. Um, so feel free to uh, navigate to that website and you can go by uh, neighborhood. Um, next slide, please. And then we also have uh, some media coverage from the SF Examiner about um, our interests and our engagement with environmental justice, um, featuring our executive director, Eddie On. Next slide, please. Um, and then lastly, we are engaged in SF Chronicle as well. So uh, one of the articles that they released last year was talking about um, sensors per zip code in California. And you can see those disadvantaged communities that we work with um, the Tenderloin, South of Market, Chinatown, et cetera, um, they have a very low sensor per people zip code, um, and we're kind of filling that gap as well. Next slide, please. And I'll turn it over to Trinity to talk about um, our James Carey Smith grant, um, our, our community, our air program. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Cecilia. So yeah, we're gonna jump into Brightline's our community, our air program. As Cecilia had mentioned, this program is funded through the James Terry Smith program, which is um, funded through the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, also known as FACMED. The program has three goals, essentially one to assess um, the needs of frontline communities, specifically on air quality, um, and then two, organize air quality decision making and exposure reduction workshops, and three, develop authentic participation of 
frontline community members in the air district's policy processes. Um, what this program really helps us do though is help leverage the data that we're collecting from Brightline's air quality network, monitoring network, um, and pass it on to community members so they can uh, authentically participate in their own environmental decision-making processes. Next slide, please, Ryan. So this program actually kicked off in March of 2022, where we um, gathered our community partners. In June of 2022, we began conducting around 66 interviews, um, which were conducted in Spanish, English, as well as Chinese. And then in September, we kicked off a series of community workshops that were based around the needs that we had found through the interviews that we conducted. Um, then in December of 2022, we actually got the opportunity to bring some of our SRO tenant leaders to the Bay Area Metro Center so they can familiarize themselves with the space that BACMED um, holds their public meetings in and um, where, yeah, all the magic happens with technology monitoring and all um, policy processes. And right now we're actually currently gathering our SRO tenant leaders um, so that way we can take them to a public meeting at the Bay Area Metro Center and we're also workshopping um, their concerns into public comments that they can make at the next meeting. Next slide, please, Ryan. So who are community partners? We have three, like Cecilia had mentioned, we work with um, CCSROC, the Central City SRO Collaborative, to work with um, folks in the Tenderloin, as well as Community Youth Center to work with um, high school youth leaders um, and also reach our Chinese speaking community. But thirdly, we also work with La Voz Latina, which helps us reach our Spanish speaking communities um, in the Tenderloins more specifically. Next slide. So here you'll see a workshop where we invited the Air District um, to come in, talk about their current pro projects and programming, as well as their next public meeting. And we actually had a translator on site. Um, here you'll see them gathered at La Cocina, which is a gathering space in the Tenderloin. Next slide. Um, here's another example of several workshops that we've held in the Tenderloin as well with our community partners. Um, on the left, you'll see, again, we brought Air District staff into Dodge Alley, a space in the Tenderloin. Um, they helped pass out calendars on the next public meeting, how they do air filtration, um, monitoring, as well as current projects. And then on the right, you'll see that we met with SRO tenant leaders at the CCSROC building, um, going over how to make public comments um, and access public meetings to uh, back men. Next slide. And then lastly, you'll see here our CYC youth leaders. And here they're actually teaching a senior technology class through CYC, um, giving information about wildfire preparedness, how to use Brightline's air quality monitoring network, as well as promoting um, BACMED spare the air um, alerts and programming. Um, so yeah, these workshops are actually translated in Chinese as well. Next slide. And here you'll see some pictures of our field trip with our SRO tenant leaders at the Bay Area Metro Center. We brought them into the public meeting space um, and they got to see some really cool views as well. Um, just familiarizing our leaders with um, spaces where public meetings are held specifically with air quality decision-making. Next slide. Um, and with all the work that we've conducted through this grant funding, um, it's actually given us visibility. And this visibility has allowed donors to help um, help Brightline distribute 150 air filtration devices into several communities, um, such as Soma, Tenderloin, and Chinatown, um, specifically within SRO communities in these three neighborhoods. So you'll see some pictures of our distribution events um, and how grant funding and also the Brightline Air Quality Monitoring Network has allowed us to, again, um, make air quality filtration more accessible in the end. Next slide. So that's all the time we have for today, but if you guys have any questions, we will be happy to answer them and you can drop them in the um, Q&A chat. Thank you. Thanks, Trinity. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Cecilia. Um, so please do uh, post your questions in the chat. Um, I'd like to move on to Adrian Rain with Valley Vision as well. Um, Thanks, Adrian. Thank you, Sean, and really excited to be here. My name is Adrian Rand with Valley Vision. You can go to the next slide. 
Uh, and I'm here, I'm here to talk to you about the Sacramento Neighborhoods Activating on Air Quality Project, or SNAC, which is a, a great acronym. Um, but Valley Vision is a, a nonprofit located in Sacramento, really focused on improving quality of life in our region. Um, next slide, please. And we got started with this work through advocacy that our organization was doing with, with a coalition of other orgs um, around advocacy for the AB 670 program that, that was described by Sean. Um, you can see on this map the, the current AB 617 communities, which again are frontline communities that have been highly impacted by air pollution um, um, that are organizing themselves for, for emission reduction. Um, and we were able to successfully advocate for the South Sacramento Florin community to be selected in that first round of communities back in 2018. Um, and you can go to the next slide. However, we had other communities in our area that, that had uh, similar needs that were formerly redlined communities, black and brown communities that suffered from high pollution burdens. So you can see on this map, the purple outline is the formal uh, AB 617 community that CARB has selected. Then these other shaded communities are areas that we've been working in, North Sacramento Oak and Oak Park Fruit Ridge and, and um, possibly Meadowview in the future. Next slide, please. So our uh, community air grant program also was our, our source of funding, similar to Brightline. Um, and here's just a you know an outline of what our, our 2019 effort was all about, um, hosting uh, listening sessions in several languages, um, identifying locations for monitors, deploying those, those clarity monitors, um, and then doing some data analysis and action planning. Next slide. We put together some um, essentially you know, conditions assessments of our neighborhoods, looking at things like traffic density, life expectancy, and more by census tract. You can go to the next slide. And really what, what these maps help with is helping community members place the monitors. So we showed community members these, these graphics, um, and then we had a conversation about areas of concern in their communities where we wanted to place the clarity monitors. Next slide. And uh, here's a, a screenshot of the, the pins um, uh, specifically in locations that community members were concerned about. We actually use Google My Maps to create this. So if you're listening and you're thinking about tools to use, Google My Maps is a really good, easy to use, accessible one for helping to map stuff. Next slide. And here's the, the Clarity unit. So these are the Clarity Node S um, devices that we were uh, able to secure through our friends at Clarity as part of, part of our community air grants. Um, they work great. Again, um, very easy to deploy, solar powered. Um, you can put them in parks, on rooftops, wherever, uh, and they just work. And that was really important for us um, considering that we're a nonprofit. We don't have a ton of capacity to, to mess around with tech. Um, we just wanted stuff to work. Um, so that we could really focus on working with our community members. Next slide. Here's some deployment photos. Got to have those. Next slide. And some media coverage. Um, when the, the monitoring network went live, again, we placed 20 air monitors. Next slide. And we also developed an educational curriculum, um, basically structured around uh, folks learning about what might be in their air, learning about environmental justice, indoor air quality as well, and then how to actually advocate for um, um, advocacy, basically advocate for solutions um, to these emissions issues in their neighborhoods. Next slide. And your, uh, I guess, photos of our curriculum in action. Next slide. And then we were able to synthesize some of the data uh, here. And this is a very simple analysis. This kind of speaks to, you know, hey, how should I visualize my data? Keep it simple. This is just a mean averaging of PM 2.5 levels over the course of a year. So it helps people uh, in, in the neighborhood understand where, you know, potential areas of concern might be. And basically these are, you know, these are AQI readings. So the higher the number, the higher the, the uh, level of, of PM 2.5. Next slide. And here's the, the Oak Park area. Next slide. And then we engaged in community-based planning with our community partners. Um, so we, we um, worked with neighbors to have intimate uh, environmental justice listening sessions. Um, we also had a, a self-guided EJ tour where folks could walk around their neighborhood looking at our, our data map and then um, you know, mark down things that they saw in the neighborhood that might be uh, concerning. 
Um, and we had a couple of fun virtual block parties as well, uh, where we had, had some good giveaways. Next slide. And then our, our product of our first community air grant was really um, these action plans. We just wanted to keep them simple, one page community air action plans for each neighborhood. Um, and, and they're really a starting point for our, our second and current uh, community air grant to um, build out these strategies further and then to prioritize them via a participatory budgeting process. And the idea is that these can feed into the formal AB 617 process down the line if our communities are selected. And, that, and that's really our long game is, you know, to not only have one formal AB 617 community um, in our region, but to have more. Next slide. And here's, here's the slide about our current work. So as I said, um, SNAC 2.0, uh, our current 2021 air grant is about taking those one page action plans and actually you know, working with neighbors to, to prioritize these, these actions so that we know when and where and how to implement mission reduction strategies. And again, this is part of that, that AB 617 pre-work that we hope will lead to a formal designation. Um, we are also, we set aside $100,000 of our budget uh, for community members to program. So um, that's been a, a real, I think, impactful way for, for neighbors to plug in and have feel real uh, ownership over the decision making process. And then, as part of our current grant, we're also advancing a small workforce uh, workforce development pilot um, with an emission reduction component that community members are currently identifying. Next slide. And that's it. Appreciate the opportunity and look forward to questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Adrian. Um, it's been really exciting watching how much work has been done by Valley Vision and then as well as with the Cleaner Air Partnership. I think both in the Bay Area and the SAC Metro, it's exciting seeing kind of this coalescence right now of discrete air monitoring projects increasingly collaborating on a regional basis in terms of air quality management more generally, um, something that I think establishes a lot of efficiencies and scale. I'd also just compliment both Brightline and Valley Vision um, for the tremendous challenge of doing this work through the pandemic the last couple of years, which I know derailed a lot of the activities and um, kind of strategy overall of how these groups are doing this and the tenacity, the success that they still managed to achieve, I think it's extremely inspiring um, at the end of the day. So with this, I'd love to jump over to my colleague, Aubrey. Um, so introduce her from Clarity, as well as her experience previously working together with Love My Air. Talk a little bit about what that's looked like, but over to you, Aubrey. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I'm excited to put on an old hat today and talk a little bit about my experience with the Love My Air project. So I wanted to spend a few minutes just kind of going over a project overview, but my hope is that you're also feeling really inspired by all of the projects you're hearing about today and maybe interested in pursuing grant funding or expanding your project scope. Um, so I wanted to talk specifically about some of the challenges and lessons that I've learned throughout managing a grant process that you may want to consider as you think about your project scope. Um, and so the Love My Air project was or is a program run by the city and county of Denver in partnership with Denver Public Schools, working to address historic air quality issues around the city from industry and traffic in the city to agriculture and wildfire smoke impacts in the neighboring area. We also noticed that Denver public school students have higher rates of asthma. And so wanted to further investigate a possible correlation between air pollution and high asthma rates. So looked to focus um, since 2018 in, on installing over 40 sensors across the Denver public school district. Again, focusing on some of those schools with higher asthma rates or um, higher economic needs. And then pairing that monitoring with real-time access to air quality information, as well as developing behavior change and more informational programming around air quality. And this program was supported by a 2018 Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge grant through Bloomberg Philanthropies, which funded the program through 2022. Next slide, please. Um, this program, like I said, was a partnership with Denver Public Schools. Um, so both the district administration, as well as lots of relationship building with teachers, nurses, parents, 
um, through focus groups, surveys, and one-on-one -on -one relationships to really build out what we wanted the project scope to look like. Again, identifying sites where we wanted to monitor and how we would share that air quality information. And so that led to the development of this Love My Air brand, which people get really excited about and it's easily recognizable, can feel connected to. Um, and then, um, oh, okay, slides are back, great. Uh, and then um, as well as developing custom dashboards. So each school has a TV monitor that displays their school's air quality information in real time, as well as via a website and a phone app. Um, also worked to address inequities around traditional air quality messaging, making sure that all of the information was available in Spanish, which is primarily the second theory language in Denver, um, as well as just being more inclusive with messaging, recognizing some of the traditional behavior change type messages may not work for people that don't have access to a pers personal vehicle or may live in areas with transit deserts or not complete sidewalks or bike lanes. Um, so making sure that we were offering um, suggestions for folks that they could feel empowered to take care of their own health and their family's health, as well as their contribution to air pollution. Um, also worked to develop partnerships with academic and research institutions, such as University of Denver, Colorado University, Colorado State University, and um, National Jewish Health to develop lots of different pieces, including a data correction algorithm for our sensors, increased monitoring efforts, looking at specific use cases like wildfire smoke impacts, indoor air quality, um, but then also were able to help us with their expertise develop STEM and health-based curriculum for use in the classrooms. Um, if you wouldn't mind, oh, here we go. Perfect, on to this next slide. Um, so like I said, um, we're back to that, the future slide, sorry. <laughs> we're jumping around here. Um, but um, while I am no longer a member of the city and county of Denver, the project still lives on with some incredible support. Um, now they're entirely supported by city funding, um, as well as several full-time staff people. Um, and they are really looking to take this project in new and exciting ways, including developing out their air quality app and website. Um, in fact, if you are a Colorado based project, they are looking to expand the amount of air quality sensors they host on their website. So if you are interested in sharing your air quality data for free on that website, please reach out to this contact here. Um, otherwise, the program has also expanded to other entities that are using the Love My Air branding and framework to launch their own air networks. Um, and they are taking this into some really exciting new areas, such as working with recreation centers, libraries, elderly care facilities, and more. Um, next slide, please. Um, so one of the most prominent issues that we ran into during this project was trying to operate a school-based project in the middle of a pandemic, which was something that was unknowable and unavoidable. Um, but some other things that we ran into was, well, we had a strong level of buy-in from the administration at the school district. The city and county is a separate entity from the um, school district. And so when it came time to be aggressive with policies or getting STEM curriculum into classrooms, that's not something we had a strong um, realm of influence over. So something to maybe consider if you are looking to work directly with a certain population or a certain community, um, making sure that there's folks that um, can operate within that sphere of influence that are in that initial grant funding and that there is some, whether it's contractual or monetary buy-in from them as well. Um, another thing that we learned was that there were a lot more resources and funds that would need to go into making sure that our program was accessible as possible. While we had native Spanish speakers on our staff, um, you know, time and effort for translation and interpretation of materials as well as in-person meetings was definitely an additional cost 
um, making sure that the air quality information was available and other places besides a, you know, a smartphone app. Um, not everyone always has access to smartphones or reliable internet connection. So how can we meet people where they're at in the schools um, or if we're hosting public meetings, asking for feedback, uh, making sure that we were meeting people where they were at when they were at and that we were helping people overcome some of those economic barriers to participation. Um, next slide, please. Oh, oh no, right. I think I'm, am, I, am I missing a slide? Oh, oh, nope, here we go, perfect. Okay, we're back. Um, and so in, in that vein, um, I think some things that would be important to consider as you're thinking about how you may scope out your grant funding. Um, I think it's easy to want to spend as much of that grant funding as possible on like the sexiest cutting edge air quality sensors. Um, and sometimes that leaves gaps for doing the important work with the community. So in that vein, uh, making sure that you can factor in costs for translation interpretations um, fees. If you're asking people to participate on sites, making sure that you are covering fees for the sites, childcare, possibly food and snacks, um, even stipends and forms of gift cards or bus passes for their people's times. Um, another huge piece is the underestimation of what it takes to run a air quality network, as well as all of the fun grant requirements and reporting aspects. Um, so we consider um, incorporating at least one full-time staff person into that grant funding. Um, for the Love My Air project, that was me, um, but we also had up to five part-time people at any time helping with additional aspects of this project. Um, another huge um, learning was making sure that we had really clear use of this data. I think another pet peeve that a lot of us here may share is that um, I think people again excited to monitor. You get sensors out at a bunch of places and then it sits in a Dropbox somewhere or in a highly technical research paper behind a paywall. How can we make sure that the air quality information, especially from the communities that we're collecting, are actually getting access to and know what to do and how to use this air quality information. Um, and then the last piece of wisdom that I'll leave you with that I received from a community leader and researcher by the name of Gwen Smith. Um, she always talks about the importance of making sure that the project itself offers value back into the community. There's a huge effort on focusing on in these environmental justice communities. A lot of the time we are going in and we're researching the hell out of them, but we're not necessarily providing them resources back through that same research project. And so how can we make sure that while we're asking people to spend their time, um, put air quality sensors in their homes, talk about their personal experiences and impacts, how are we providing deposits back into the community, providing a clear value beyond just access to air quality data. Um, and so with that, I will leave you and I'm excited to get more questions. Back to you, Sean. Thank you so much, Aubrey. Um, really want to emphasize how exciting it is to see all the work that's happened in Denver. Um, and this is such a great example of how grants can really catalyze, build the foundation for these enduring programs, but it really does require these partners to coalesce and build this vision and then step up to sustain it. So that's something that, you know, most grants, it's a finite funding amount, it's a finite grant term. So having that plan of how you can build this moving forward, and I can't emphasize enough what Aubrey said, don't just dump it on equipment. It's about building the capacity, the connections, the best practices in terms of the engagement and the partnerships that really make these things thrive. Um, I did want to also emphasize the value of data sharing. So with Love My Air. So quick shout out to our Chris and the team at OpenAQ on here. So big proponents of making data available to the broader community. Assuming the data has been well QA, QC'd and is useful, open it up, make it available to people who you don't know who's going to come out of the woodwork and provide valuable insights for your community, whether that's a public health agency that wasn't part of the coalition, et cetera. Um, so really, really want to encourage that. And that's something else we can chat about. So um, conscious of time here. So jump over, last but not least, the Principal Air Quality Specialist with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and Bay Air Center collaborator, Michael Flagg. So thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Yeah, I'm super glad to be here and listening to all these amazing projects is super inspiring. Um, I'm hoping to just provide a little bit of perspective from a local air district. Um, 
And I, you know, I'm, I work in a, a small office in the meteorology and measurements division. We do a lot of air monitoring and data analysis and things like that. So um, next slide. Um, we've got a lot of folks um, uh, from around the country today. So I just wanted to do a quick uh, orientation on, on the air district itself. We were established in 1955, which was the first regional air quality district um, in the nation. Um, we have a large governing board and we cover a really large area, right? We have nine counties, 5,000 square miles, 7 million residents. And the big takeaway from that is we have a lot of unique communities that are facing very different air pollution um, issues. We have communities that are near refineries. We have communities that are near um, many different types of, of sources. So the solutions are, 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 the solutions and problems are very varied across this broad geographic area. Um, the Air District does a lot of work. Um, we develop rules, we do permitting, we have a uh, community engagement office, uh, but we do do monitoring. Um, we monitor at 32 locations throughout the Bay Area. We measure um, criteria pollutants, toxics, black carbon, and ultrafine particles. So we, we collect and, and utilize that data to do a number of different things. Um, but um, yeah, go to the next slide and talk about um, some of the community-led sensor networks in the Bay Area. Um, you know, we have, we do have many community led sensor networks. Um, this is a map of, of this is a clarity <laughs> workshop. So I put a map of the clarity, uh, clarity sensors here, but we have, um, you know, community groups that are using clarity send nodes. We have, uh, community groups that are using other technologies. Um, you know, a lot of these groups are primarily funded by state and local grants. Um, and, you know, from the air district perspective, um, you know, these sensor networks can really provide valuable insights to local air quality issues. I think, you know, we can leverage the density of these networks to better understand spatial differences. We can leverage the short temporal um, measurements to understand variations. And so they really are another tool um, in our toolbox for understanding what's happening on a local level. Um, next slide, please. You know, so we have all of these, we have many uh, community led networks, we have, um, you know, there's a lot of, of historical um, disadvantaged communities in the Bay Area and, you know, one of the air districts uh, missions is to provide support to these projects. Um, these are just some of the kind of high level kind of um, objectives for the air district, I think, from a, from the, the technical side, which is you know, how does the Air District support community-led objectives? How do we prioritize community lived experience and local knowledge? Um, you know, Sean mentioned in the, in, in the beginning that, you know, sensor data is great, but it's not the only thing. And I think really lifting up, um, you know, local community knowledge and experience is a really important aspect of, of uh, problem solving um, some of these issues. You know, we're, we're in the business of building partnerships um, to provide technical support um, in a number of different ways. And a couple other things that we've continued to hear throughout this, this, this webinar is like, how do we, how do we facilitate access to existing data sources? There's so much information out there, you know, and how do we reduce barriers to accessing funding? And so these are just a couple of high level things. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can talk about some specifics about how the Air District works with um, community-led sensor networks. Um, we do provide kind of a level of, of analysis of existing data, as well as uh, data collected by these sensor networks. These are some examples on the right of work that a colleague of mine did with data from um, the uh, Richmond San Pablo network, um, looking at spatial variations and looking at differences across, um, across time and really picking out kind of local hotspots and kind of further areas of examination. Um, you know, one of the advantages of, of being in my position is that, you know, we have, um, a, you know, this view of the air quality data, and we can also link that data and that data analysis and that interpretation to other air district programs, whether that's like feeding into AB 617 community emission reduction plans, or community air monitoring plans, or feeding that information into compliance and enforcement. You know, we provide kind of the link between what's happening on the ground and how do we integrate that with existing kind of programs and things like that. So, um, we also, uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll cover um, another mechanism um, of how we provide support in a more specific way. Um, next slide, please. Great, thanks. Um, which is um, something called the Bay Air Center, which is a, an independent third-party contract um, that we use to provide direct support to community-led um, air monitoring projects that, that are funded by these, these different grants. 
Um, this has a coordination and facilitation and technical component. I'll do a shout out to Tim Dye from uh, TD Environmental Services, who is I see is in the participant list. He is a, a, a major partner in this program and brings a ton of expertise. Um, but this really is a uh, designed to be a flexible, um, in-kind resource for, for these projects that can provide a, a variety of, of really specific tailored, um, tailored resources, whether that's training, or, or hands-on field support. Um, Cecilia mentioned that you know we do do provide in-field verification um, with a portable system that we have. We have the capability of doing data analysis um, and lots of different things. So, um, you know, I think this is a really um, a great resource that we've been working on building up capacity for um, in the last couple of years, and has you know has a lot of um, there's a lot of great people working on this to to kind of bring that kind of information and support to these projects. Um, the last final thing here is that, you know, we have been providing assistance with grant applications themselves. We've been working with a handful of folks doing that, which is which is really important um, to, you know, to get funding in the hands of the community to, and, and really, you know, allow those projects to, to, um, to flourish with, um, with their own kind of objectives and, and timeframes. So, um, that was a really quick <laughs> overview, um, trying to get, save some time here for Q&A, so I'll pass it back to Sean. Michael, thank you so much, and really appreciate the uh, time economics there. Um, the grant support, I think, is a great segue. Obviously, grant writing is challenging. Um, we spend a lot of time helping partners. We just got over the CARB Community Air Grant submission last Friday, thankfully. Um, so diving right into the Q&A. So I know we do technically have four minutes left on the agenda. Unfortunately, I have a hard stop at 11, but my colleague Ryan will be able to take over the Q&A um, shortly here. Um, but wanted to jump right into a first question um, with our partners here. What are some of the challenges and barriers with grant funded air quality projects that you faced in terms of planning, implementation, operational phases? How did you kind of overcome these, address these? What's been persistent? And maybe we'll start with Brightline's perspective on this. Yeah, so I think um, definitely one of the good things is that we partnered with community uh, members and community leaders that really knew the landscape of San Francisco and the, uh, the populations we wanted to serve. Um, the most obvious one is obviously the pandemic and trying to deploy uh, 21 different sensors across the city where um, everybody was at home, nobody was like answering their office lines. Um, yeah, contracts uh, take really long as well. So um, I believe we had a question in the Q&A section about um, how do you get permission? And that's kind of one of the challenges that comes along with such a big network. But I'll pass it over to Eddie in case I missed any challenges. And just to understand, it takes time, I think. It took months, for instance, to gain some of these permissions uh, from local government agencies. I think it just depends what jurisdiction you're in at the end of the day. Great, thank you. Um, same question, Adrian, from your experience. Um, biggest challenges working with grants, around grants, implementation of the grants, um, you know, helping people avoid the same landmines that we've been through. Well, historically funding has been a big issue and that seems just in the last year or two to really have been flipped on its head. You know, there is, it almost feels like the problem is keeping opportunities straight from one another, considering how many US EPA, uh, and state uh, funding opportunities there are. And so finding out how to align and leverage them, I feel like is really the new challenge. Um, so we don't risk everybody recreating um, what's already been done or, or duplicating what's already been done. So alignment is a challenge. Um, just for our projects, um, I always talk about citing the monitor. So finding locations, um, give yourself extra time. Um, and one thing that you might consider doing is leverage private property owners instead of trying to work with utilities or cities, because um, there's a lot of paperwork involved when you partner with governments. Whereas, you know, what I did is I had a van full of monitors and I drove around North Sacramento knocking on doors of businesses and with, with, my, with a little sheet that I'd ask folks to sign and I'd go, you know, get the ladder, climb up on the rooftop, you know, and it was a handshake and a, and a signature. So much easier can be done in 15 minutes as opposed to who knows how long with, with uh, partnering with governments. So private property owners are, are a strategy. Really great point, Adrian. I often joke that the hardest part of our job around the world is getting permission to access light posts um, from city to city. Um, 
So I would love to pass this question on to Aubrey um, and then subsequently to Michael as well, having the government perspective, well, both of you having government perspectives on grants. Um, I will make a quiet exit at this point and share um, further Q&A with my colleague Ryan, but thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the webinar. All right, thanks for joining, Sean. Thanks, okay. Sean. I think to, to echo everyone else's point, I think the timing and site access is, can be, if you're not planning carefully, can be a huge barrier. Um, we were able to streamline that process a little bit by having a site access agreement with Denver Public Schools. So that allowed us access to over 240 of their campuses throughout the city. So it was one agreement, although it did take quite a while. Um, so something to think about, especially if your grant timeline is two years, by the time you can secure access permissions, um, do co-locations and calibrations of instrumentation, you may get uh, worst case only a year's worth of air quality information. So how can you set up that timeline um, to make sure that there's adequate time for um, whether that's community involvement and project scoping ahead of the monitoring. Um, and so you're not just sitting waiting for your project to start, but have other pieces that don't require active air quality monitoring to start engaging community members. Great, thanks. Thanks, Aubrey and Michael, did you uh, have any thoughts you wanted to weigh in uh, with on, on that, that topic? Yeah, I mean, I think I I, I, I talked about it really quickly in the in that last slide, but you know, one of the, one of the big barriers is, is like the grant application process itself. Um, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of um, technicality that goes into those grants. Um, there's a lot of process that goes into those grants. Um, you know, we've been working with the Bay Area Center to provide, um, you know, a handful of community groups um, application support. So actually giving them support on the application process. And that includes things like um, scoping or budgeting for sensors or matching technology with objectives and things like that. So, um, you know, I also, you know, when I when I worked at EPA for for a long time, I was the technical lead for the tribal air monitoring grant program. And, you know, a lot of from a grant reviewer perspective, um, in that capacity, you know, the most successful applications were ones that that kind of match the appropriate technology to the appropriate study design to kind of specific desired outcomes or goals or objectives. So, kind of having you know all of that kind of um, you know thought out in, in in particular for that grant application, it, it goes a long way, I think, in the eyes of of the the folks that are looking at these type of applications. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thanks. Thanks, Michael, for sharing uh, your thoughts on that. Um, you know, I am cognizant. We're two minutes over. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, both, you know, panelists and attendees. I guess just to wrap, um, as people are, you know, there have been a few questions in the chat about, you know, the different funding opportunities available. We'll follow up with the recording, with the slides from this webinar, and also with some more information about the funding opportunities available. Any parting thoughts from any of our panelists about, you know, best practices for writing a proposal, you know, things you might overlook when you're initially scoping an air quality monitoring program, uh, you know, any any just, uh, you know, quick tips that you would impart to, to folks thinking about applying for, you know, any of these various funding opportunities? Um, I would probably recommend just putting in some uh, community stipends or community partnership, uh, you know, uh, monetary incentives uh, in your package and kind of uh, make sure to account for that. Yep, that's uh, I think for some of you that, oh, sorry. Um, I'll just be brief. For some of you that might be aware, back in the day, it used to be like, oh, you could, you know, uh, serve people food and that would, you know, essentially uh in a way resource community participation but i do think over time now we've seen the standards become a lot higher so cecilia's point is uh about right just make sure that there are stipends for direct community participation absolutely um third i will third that and then um, also encourage folks to you know think about think about inputs into your process throughout your throughout your scope of work for these grants so where can community members help shape what you're doing? Where can they tell you where to put monitors? Where can they 
help design your process or design what community-based organizations you might be subcontracting with. Um, you know, what, one example of that is we we were working on a like a, a mural project that had a, a message on it. This is unrelated to this this specific air grant, but it, it talked about like encouraging folks to use their food stamps or their EBT at farmers markets. Um, and we had an artist design a message around it. The, the message had fruits and vegetables all around it. And then we workshopped that, that mock-up with a group of non-English speakers uh, in partnership with our food bank in the, in the neighborhood. So folks were speaking Spanish and Russian. And the artists had done this like stylized kind of, um, the stylized version of all the fruits and vegetables, kind of rustic looking. And the non-English speakers said, that fruit looks terrible. That does not look nutritious. That doesn't look good. It makes me not want to use my EBT at farmer's markets. So when you start to like hold these spaces for non-English speakers and folks, um, folks who, who often don't have the opportunity to provide input, you'll get really important feedback for how you design things. So think about how you can build in those inputs and those workshops into your scope of work. Your, your final product will be a lot better. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Adrian. I think that's an important point about community input. And it really gets to, you know, the core of that that tip that Aubrey had of, you know, asking yourself, will this project serve the community without, you know, collecting community input, you really can't, you know, come up with a good answer to that question. Um, and, you know, we certainly want to see all of this funding, you know, being used in in a way that's actually serving communities across the country. So, uh, you know, thank, thank you for that, that insight. Um, Aubrey or Michael, anything uh, you would weigh in with before we wrap up here on on that topic of uh, you know just things to consider as you're you know moving toward writing a grant uh, application? Uh, I think I'll quickly elaborate on Adrian's point around just understanding community culture and level of understanding. I think as someone that has been really in the weeds on air quality, it's sometimes you. Um, needing to say, take a step back and understand where people's basis of air quality information is. We had heard some interesting things during um, during focus groups where people would say, oh, well, I'll encourage my kids to run to school instead of walking because then they'll be exposed to air pollution for less time. And so being able to really clearly um, and understand people's understanding of air quality and its impacts on human health, but also how do we translate air quality in a way where we're not throwing around PM 2.5 and AQI, all of this confusing language of how can we, we simplify that and making sure you're writing um, time and development of resources into your grant in addition to monitoring. I mean, I'll just, I mean, I think what, what, what everyone said um, is 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 really valuable um, from from the community organizing perspective. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think it's you know it is really important to um, provide the space and time to listen to community in a meaningful way. I mean, these conversations um, take time and they're worth getting right. Um, and so, you know, giving the appropriate amount of of space for that to happen, um, I think, is really important to kind of. Um, you know, kind of drive some of these community community led um, objectives and kind of um, working towards kind of those those the things that are most important for for the folks that are living and breathing the air um, in these communities. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And seems like uh, your your district is doing a great job of uh, of that with the Bay Air Center. So it was very interesting to hear more about the the work that uh, Backmed is is doing in that area. Um, all right, well, I know we're uh, quite a bit over time, lots of good questions. So thank you everyone uh, who's uh, you know interacted with, with our panelists through the Q&A. Um, seems like you know, there could be potential for another webinar on this topic, given uh, the volume of, of questions we got and you know the amount of material to cover, but we will wrap up for today. Uh, I am going to mention that we have another webinar on Thursday, March 23rd, coming up, also community air monitoring focused. Uh, this will be with Darren Riley, a partner of ours at Just Air Solutions, and Kareem Scales, who is the co-chair of C4, a group that fosters uh, community-based climate action. Um, and this project uh, that we'll be focusing on is, is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So we'll be jumping, uh, you know, to a different different part of the country to look at some of the community air quality monitoring work that's that's happening 
in the Midwest. Um, we'll share a link for that as well as the recording slides and uh, more information about the funding opportunities available with all registrants. So everyone can expect that uh, to see that in their inboxes in the next several days. And with that, I'll just say, you know, thank you to all of our panelists. Really appreciate you joining to share your perspective on, on this topic. Um, and likewise, thank you to all of our attendees for, for joining today. We had a great turnout and uh, yeah, I think a really interesting conversation that, that we'll hope to uh, continue and, and carry on into to future events. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's a wrap for today. Thanks everyone for joining and uh, we'll follow up with resources uh, in the next several days. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Thank you.